Welcome to Kent Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. This show is heard on WBCQ The Planet every Monday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It also is uh, picked up by ipmnation.org, and I think it's Saturday afternoons at 1 p.m., and it, uh, it's broadcast out of, uh, it's, on, it's an online um, 24-hour entity, and it broadcast out of Concord, and of course, WBCQ is out of, uh, Montes- uh, comes out of Monticello, Maine, in beautiful Arista County, and the show is hosted by or sponsored by Camp Constitution, which, among other things, runs a wonderful family camp, family and unaccompanied minors weekly summer camp. Uh, our camp is coming up in a little bit less than two months. It runs from July 10th to the 17th, actually a weekend a day. And we have a great lineup of speakers, instructors, and all kinds of uh, interesting, challenging things to do for Young and old alike, we're going to have Mrs. Chrisanne Hall, who is uh, one of our featured instructors. She is a phenomenal lady. She travels around the country uh, promoting limited government under the Constitution. She speaks to Christian groups, church groups, civic groups, elected officials, and you can visit her website, chrisannehall.org, I think, or .com. I think it might be a .org. Anyway, she's all over the U- all over YouTube to her wonderful presentations, and we've uh, she's been. This will be her third year coming to camp, and uh, she's been a real blessing to us. Also have John McManus. Uh, he is a, um, a writer, author. Uh, he's authored uh, numerous books. He's been giving presentations on the United Nations. He's one of the top experts on the subject of the UN, uh, as well as a few other classes. Uh, he's an author of Financial Terrorism, so he'll be giving a class on economics, uh, but it's not your typical news type of class where it's boring and a lot of graphs and scales, but really good old uh, information that people should know and need to know. And you can learn more about our camp by visiting our website, www.campconstitution.net. On our website, you will find a camp bookstore where you can find some of the things we've published and some of the reprinted items we've, uh, we've done over the last several years. Camp bumper sticker, uh, camp T-shirts, and uh, just a lot of other things. And all our T-shirts are made in USA, 100% cotton. Uh, what else? Uh, you will find uh, what I'm, I think, most proud of uh, in the last six months is the Sam Blumenfeld archive. The late Sam Blumenfeld was a dear friend of ours and a, a, an instructor over the years, and he left his library to us. So we've been archiving many of his uh unpublished uh, books, pamphlets, uh, articles, as well as his newsletters, about 170 speeches that we had on cassette that we put on to audio MP3 format, as well as MP4 video format, and his alphaphonics and all 128 lessons, video or audio. So it's really a great resource for all, and it's free, folks. Uh, Sam Parse and Legacy. But as you know, if you're listening to this show, and if you're a regular on this station, you probably know a lot of free market types. Nothing is free, so we always need to have financial support. You can do that by visiting our website and hitting the PayPal button, and you can make a donation or become a sponsor of our camp. Just uh, for $100 a year, you get your business or company or nonprofit or whatever you have uh, listed as a camp sponsor. So, Lots of things have happened in the last few days. Our uh, President Obama, as my friend Reverend James David Manning calls him, the Mac Daddy, uh, he just issued an, uh, a presidential executive order saying that all public schools around the country have to have these transgenders uh, now in your bathroom. So if you're a young lady and you uh, want to go to your girl's room, you might have a man. Uh, a teenager who is either confused, gender confused, or he could just be a, a pervert. And and what's to stop him? Hey, if he thinks he's a woman today, he wants to get a peek at your daughter. And interesting is this is an indication of how far our nation has declined when something like this is allowed. And it's under the banner of federal money coming into the states. 
So, folks, we don't need to have an Article 5 convention. Of course, these Convention of States people always jump on every time uh, something like this happens. Oh, this is the solution. This is the solution. No, not, not the solution. The solution is you say no. It's unconstitutional. He has absolutely no, no uh, constitutional authority to issue this. And if it means sending the money back, well, send the money back to stop taking the money. You have no business taking it. Taking federal money for education is much like buying that stolen TV set from the thief. And I say this because the rationale is, well, if we don't take it, someone else will take it. Another state will take it. So when that person who's uh, trying to sell you a hot TV set or a computer or a radio, whatever, uh, and you can say, well, gee, uh, I have to buy it from him because if I don't buy it, somebody else will. No, that makes you, uh, you're receiving stolen goods. That's really the bottom line. I like H.L. Mencken's uh, definition of elections. He said it's nothing more than a future auction, uh, an auction for future stolen goods. So stop taking the stolen goods, states. All of you Republican governors, if you're going to stand up, and restore you and get the balance of power. Do it right now. You don't have to worry about a convention that's going to rewrite the Constitution, or restructure the Constitution. Um, if it ever happens, it might be, you know, before these things come into effect, it might be years away. So stop that nonsense and just tell them, no, we're not going to do it. And if you're a principal of a school, say, we're not going to do it. And if it means you'll be arrested, then let them arrest you. And students and parents, Stop, uh, you know, just, you need, to, you need to just take action. Enough is enough of this stuff. So, anyway, in my travels, I like to stop at local libraries, and uh, you, you never know what you're going to find at these libraries. Some of these are uh, little history museums. They're really treasure troves. The smaller the library and the more quaint the town, usually the more interesting the library. I was in... Um, not, a, a library not too far from Boston. I think it was Menden, Massachusetts. And this was about a year ago, and I popped in there. And when I do visit libraries, I might leave information, back issues of magazines, um, uh, uh, camp constitution brochures, uh, flyers of what it was, different things. And I'll visit the used, uh, or they usually have friends of the library book sales. So I picked up this really interesting book for a whole dollar. I see what happens is a lot of libraries have been purging their their book their libraries of the the important books the good books. In some cases they just throw them away, and then they're burnt. By the way, you talk about book burners. Well, the, the liberals are the worst book burners. I remember I found a barrel full of books uh, in front of the library near my my home when I used to live in the Hyde Park section of Boston, and they were great things on the Constitution on the Founding Fathers. There was a few books written by Eleanor Roosevelt, and the trash is probably the right place for anything that uh, that scoundrel wrote. But there were some really nice books, and libraries. most libraries don't want to deal with these topics anymore. They purge them. Uh, it was interesting. Um, uh, last year, uh, we made a donation, or tried to donate, a copy of Sam Blumenfeld and Alex Newman's book, Crimes of the Educators, and brand new copy, we we're happy to do it, and they wouldn't take it. They refused it. It took a few weeks before we got it back. And the idea is that somehow this didn't meet their peer review. But they had uh, homosexual books. They had books. Uh, Heather has two mommies and that kind of junk and trash and filth. But anyway, I picked up this great little book. Well, actually, it wasn't a great little book. It was over 800 pages. It was Formation of the Union Under the Constitution. And I was published in 1937 or 35 by the U.S. government. So the book is probably available on Google Books, although I can't be certain. And uh, boy, it was uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and all these um, United States Constitution sesquicentennial Commission. And it had all these people who were leftists, not all of them, but a lot of them that are on, on here, listed on here and then uh, uh, signed by uh, Franklin Roosevelt. But I tell you, there's some gr great information here. Even back back then, I guess they didn't go out of the way to tell to lie and to, to, to re revise history. And there's a, uh, it talks a lot about the Constitution, uh, why it was brought about, and then also some early attempts to have a convention. 
And I found some things that were quite interesting to me and to those of us who are in the in the fight to uh, stop this Article Five convention. Uh, some of it I knew, but there was a, there was actually a few letters or some comments made uh, by by uh, some of the founders why a, a second convention would not be a good idea. This would I shouldn't say a second convention. This would be a convention under Article Five of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we did have a convention under the Articles of Confederation, which uh, pretty much gave us a whole new convention, I mean a whole new constitution. also has a list of the of the uh, delegates of the convention and a little biographical sketch. And what I like most of all is this uh, questions, and I'm going to go over some of them, questions that uh, are covered in the book and that people should know. It was interesting too. Some of these things, I said, boy, these, some of these questions are actually strictly constitutional. And I'm surprised um, that they got away that you know that this was in here. Uh, so uh, the question, the first question here is: In what language was Magna Carta written, and to whom was it addressed? And of course, the answer is: It was written in Latin, and it was addressed to the archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, barons. You just should. Uh, Carries, foresters, sheriffs, reeves. That's where the word shire, shire reef, so a reef must be um, maybe higher official ministers and all bailiffs and faithful subjects. Let's see, uh, when did the phase the United States of America originate? The first known use of the formal term the United States of America was in the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Paine, in February 1776, had written of free and independent states of America. The terms United Colonies, United Colonies of America, United Colonies of North America, and also states were used in 1775 and 1776. How were the deputies to the Constitutional Convention of 1787 chosen? And the answer was they were appointed by the legislators of the different states. Were there any restrictions as to the number of deputies a state may send? No. Which state did not send deputies to the Constitutional Convention? And the state was Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. That's what it was known as. Not two entities, but kind of one and two of them rolled into one. Were the other 12 states represented throughout the Constitutional Convention? No. Two of the deputies from New York left on July 10, 1787. And after that, Hamilton, the third deputy, when he was in attendance, did not attempt to cast the vote of the state. The New Hampshire deputies did not arrive until July 23rd. 1787, so that there would never a vote of more than 11 states. And it was interesting, too, because New Hampshire, uh, when the New Hampshire Convention, ratifying convention, uh, approved of the U.S. Constitution, it became the law of the land, and that was done June 21st, 1788. Where and when did the deputies to the Constitutional Convention assemble? And, of course, most people know. I should say, I shouldn't say that. Most people don't know these kinds of things, actually. Anyway, in Philadelphia, in the State House, where the Declaration of Independence was signed, the meeting was called for May 14, 1787, but the quorum was not present until May 25th. How, how about, about how large was the population of Philadelphia at that time? And it said there were about uh, 28,000 in Philadelphia and 42,000 in the immediate areas. What was the average age of the deputies to the Constitutional Convention? About 44. Who were the oldest and youngest members of the Constitutional Convention? Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, the oldest, he was then 81, and Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey, 26, and I think Dayton, Ohio, is named after him. How many lawyers were members of the Constitutional Convention? There were probably 34 out of 55 who had at least made a study of the law. Uh, from what classes of society were the members of the Constitutional Convention drawn? In addition to the lawyers, there were soldiers, planters, educators, ministers, physicians, financiers, and merchants. How many members of the Constitutional Convention had been members of the Continental Congress? 40, and two others were later members. Were there any members of the Constitutional Convention who never attended any meetings? There were 19, now this was something new to me, who were never present. Some of these declined, others merely neglected the duty. 
were the members of the Constitutional Convention called delegates or deputies? And is there any distinction between the terms? Some of the states called their representatives delegates, some deputies, and some commissioners, the terms being often mixed. In the convention itself, they're always referred to as deputies. Washington, for example, signed his name as deputy from Virginia. And by the way, Washington was the man who oversaw the convention. Uh, the point is simply that whenever they call themselves, they were representatives of their states. The general practice of historians is to describe them as delegates. Who was called the sage of the Constitutional Convention? And that should be an easy one. Benjamin Franklin. Who was called the father of the Constitution? And it was James Madison of Virginia, because in point of erudition and actual contributions to the formation of the Constitution, he was preeminent. He also took notes, and the notes weren't published many, many years later, I think, um, or made available. I think it wasn't until, it was after 1830 that they were available. Um, was Thomas Jefferson a member of the Constitutional Convention? No. Jefferson was an American minister to France at the time of the convention. And by the way, so wasn't John Adams. What did Thomas Jefferson have to do with framing the Constitution? Although absent from the Constitutional Convention and during the period of ratification, Jefferson rendered no inconsiderable service to the cause of constitutional government, but it was partially through his insistence that the Bill of Rights consisting of the First Amendment was adopted. Who presided over the Constitutional Convention? I already kind of addressed that. George Washington chosen unanimously. The fact that Washington was there, by the way, I think gave it a lot of credibility. And there were some, some of the delegates and some people weren't quite happy with the outcome. Uh, they thought that the delegates exceeded their, some of them exceeded their authority. But the fact that Washington was there, a lot of people was, were happy. To, it, gave, it gave the convention a lot of credibility. How long did it take to frame the Constitution? It was drafted in fewer than 100 working days. How much was paid for the journal kept by Madison during the Constitutional Convention? So President Jackson secured from Congress in 1837 an appropriation of $30,000. That was a lot of money back then. With which to buy Madison's journals and other papers left by him. Was there harmony in the Constitutional Convention? The answer, serious conflicts arose at the outset, especially between those representing the small and large states. And uh, there's a famous... Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, when he sensed this, uh, this, this in-house fighting here, he said something to the effect that if if a great nation, uh, if God, uh, God knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, he knows a, a great nation cannot rise up with his blessings. And he called for prayer, and there was uh, prayer, and you see that they were that they were. Um, there's a famous painting of the members of the, the, the delegates in prayer. So, uh, so anyway, um, let's see. Who was who, who presented the Virginia Plan? It was Edmund Randolph. What was the Connecticut Compromise? This was the first great compromise of the Constitutional Convention, whereby it was agreed that this, in the Senate each state should have two members, and that in the House the number of representatives was to be based upon population. Thus, the rights of the small states were safeguarded, and the majority of the population was left to be fairly represented. Who actually wrote the Constitution? Now, this was a very good question because we, because a lot of us, you know, we don't give it a, a whole lot of thought here. Uh, in none of the relatively meager records of the Constitutional Convention is the literary authorship of any part of the Constitution definitely established. The deputies debated proposed plans in, until. On July 24, 1787, substantial agreement having been reached, a committee of detail was appointed, consisting of John Rutledge of South Carolina, Edmund Randolph of Virginia, Nathaniel Gorham of Massachusetts, Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut, and James Wilson of Pennsylvania, who on August 6 reported a draft which included a preamble and 23 articles, embodying 57 sections. <clears throat> That's a whole lot. Debate continued until September 8th, when a new committee of style was named to revise the draft. This committee included William Samuel Johnson of Connecticut, Alexander Hamlin of New York, Governor Morris of Pennsylvania, James Madison of Virginia, and Rufus King of Massachusetts. 
and they reported the draft in approximately its final shape on September 12th. The actual literary form is believed to be largely that of Morris, and the chief testimony for this is in the letters and papers of Madison in Morris's claim. However, the document in reality was built it slowly and laboriously with not a piece of material included until it had been shaped and approved. The preamble was written by the Committee of Style. Um, it's something I, I can, dealing with the embossing, I'll sort of skip that because there's some really good ones here. Uh, did some of the deputies to the Constitutional Convention refuse to sign the con Constitution? Only 39 signed. 14 deputies had departed for their homes and three, Randolph and Mason of Virginia and Jerry of Massachusetts, uh, refused to sign. In fact, the Elbridge Jerry lady became vice president, and the term gerrymand was uh, used. It was the way, because the um, in Massachusetts, when they drew up the electoral map, the map of the, uh, the, the delegates, the um, uh, they kind of switch things to make sure that the Federalists would have a, a stronger hand. So today we hear the word gerryman, and we're not, not always sure where it came from, but it was Elbert Jerry. Um, okay, uh, how can it be said that the signing of the Constitution was unanimous when the deputies of only 12 states signed and some delegates refused to sign? The signatures attest the unanimous consent of the states present. The voting was by states, and the vote of each state that of a majority of its deputies. Hamilton signed this attestation for New York, though as he was the only deputy of the state president, he had not been able to cast the vote of his state for the consent. Only 11 states voting on the final question. There's an even greater discrepancy about the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Some seven or eight members present on July 4th never signed. Seven signers, including Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, who proposed a resolution of independence, was not present on the Day, and eight other signers were not members of the Congress until after July 4th. Yeah, the only person that signed it on, on July 4th was um, John Hancock, and uh, it was uh, then sent to the states, and, and then most of the delegates signed it, or the members of the Continental Congress signed it in August. Uh, this is a good question, too. Uh, did George Washington sign the Declaration of Independence? No, he wasn't. He didn't. Uh, he had been appointed commander-in-chief of the Continental Army more than a year before and was at the time of the Army in New York City. Uh, he probably would have been since he was a member of the first Continental Congress. Uh, it asked where, where's the original signed Constitution, and uh, it says here in the Second Florida Library of Congress. I think it's now in the, in the Smithsonian Institute. Let's see. There's some other questions here. One of them was really intriguing here. Um, in ratifying the Constitution, did the people vote directly? No, ratification was by special state conventions, and that's in Article 7 of the Constitution. The vote of how many states was necessary to ratify the Constitution? Nine. So under the Articles of Confederation, in order to make changes, you had to have unanimous, all 13. After the Constitution was submitted for ratification, where did the greatest contest occur? In Massachusetts, Virginia, and New York. Each instance, what was the vote? In New York, ratified the Constitution by a majority of three votes, 30 to 27. Massachusetts, 187 to 168. And Virginia, 89 to 79. In the course of ratification, how many amendments were offered by state conventions? 78, exclusive of Rhode Island's 21, and those demanded by the first convention in North Carolina. There were many others offered which were considered necessary as items of the Bill of Rights. Professor Ames gives 124 as the whole number, inclusive of those of Rhode Island. When did the United States government go into operation under the Constitution? The Constitution became binding upon nine states by the ratification of the ninth state of New Hampshire, June 21, 1788. Notice that this ratification was received by Congress July 2, 1788. On September 13, 1788, Congress adopted, now this Congress would be the uh, Articles of Confederation, adopted a resolution declaring that the electors should be appointed um, in the ratifying states on the first Wednesday, January 1789, uh, that the electors vote for president on the first Wednesday in February 1789 and at the first Wednesday in March next, 
March 4, 1789, be the time and the present seat of Congress, the place for commencing proceedings under the said Constitution. Did Washington receive the unanimous vote of the electors in his first election as president? Yes. Of all who voted. Uh, let's see. There's some, oh, here it is. What, what was W.E. Gladstone's famous remark about the Constitution? It was as follows. As the British Constitution is the most subtle organism, which has proceeded from the womb in long gestation of progressive history, so the American Constitution is, so far as I can see, the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. That's an incredible statement. What is the source of the philosophy found in the Constitution? The book which had the greatest influence upon the members of the Constitutional Convention was Montesquieu's Spirit of Laws, which first appeared in 1748. The great French philosopher had, however, in turn borrowed much of his doctrine from the Englishman John Locke, with whose writings various members of the Convention were also familiar. You see, our founders were classically trained and educated. Uh, very few uh, that serve today in, the, in, in our country, but never mind in Congress, uh, even know anything about John Locke or Montesquieu and what have you. Very few of them are familiar with books like The Law by Frederick Bastiat. They don't even know Davy Crockett's Sockdologer. Okay, now there was one question that was really intriguing here. Uh, let's see. Um, the United States government is frequently described as one of limited powers. Is this true? Yes, the United States government possesses only such powers as are specifically granted to it by the Constitution. Now, you see how, inter how we've changed so much in just a few, uh, m well, a generation. Uh, today, they think that uh, members of Congress in both parties, they, they could do just about anything they want. Then, how does it happen that the government cons constantly exercises powers not mentioned by the Constitution? Those powers simply flow from general provisions. To take a simple example, the Constitution gives the United States the right to coin money. It would certainly follow, therefore, that the government had a right to make the design for the coinage. This is what the Supreme Court calls reasonable construction. And, of course, you know, I don't think too many people would argue over that, the necessary and proper clause. Now, here is a good question. I ask this on our 10-question quiz that we give at homeschool shows and fair booths and such. Where in the Constitution is there mention of education? There is none. Education is a matter reserved for the states. Now, this is what a, a New Deal book published in 1937 says. New Dealers, folks, said that the federal government has no business in education. It's left to the states. Somebody ought to tell uh, what we do, but they don't listen. Who was called the expounder of the Constitution? Daniel Webster of Massachusetts. He was a, became a senator and later secretary of state. Uh, because of his forceful and eloquent orations interpreting the document. Uh, Daniel Webster actually was a friend uh, of an ancestor of mine, a professor of theology at Dartmouth, and when the, the legislature of, of New Hampshire tried to take the college over, he actually defended uh, Professor Shirtliff and uh, won his case at the Supreme Court. Well, gee, this is the fastest half hour in radio. Uh, it's almost time for us to end the show. But I tell you, it's just interesting when you find these books. Uh, it was, uh, I paid a whole dollar for this 800-something page book, and it's really interesting how... Uh, and then it has uh, uh, liberty documents, pages and pages of uh, petitions of rights, and uh, just an incredible something that uh, you won't find. Uh, but for a dollar, you see, you know, we're trying to get rid of for a whole dollar, folks. I got this. So... Um, Maybe we will, uh, I don't think we're going to reprint this, but maybe if we can find it in Google Images, uh, Google Books, we'll make it available on our script page. Well, thanks for listening. You've been listening to Camp Constitution Radio with Hal Shirtliff, heard on WBCQ The Planet. And please visit our website at www.campconstitution.net. 